Uh, yeah. So it's called Fields Spectroscopy, and I, of course, haven't attended any of the other talks, so there will probably be overlap, for which I will apologize in advance. Um, shout at me if it gets boring. Uh, so I'll go through kind of what is an integral field spectrograph. Uh, I'm going to stand over here. Uh, what you can study with such a thing, what kinds are there, how I prepare uh, integral field spectrograph observations. Did you ask my permission before you post that online? <laughs> I have posted one. I'll post on this one. Cool. How do I prepare integral field spectrograph observations and how do I reduce, view, and analyze my data? Um, this is a vaguely updated version of the talk I gave at a similar workshop in 2011. Um, and there's been a lot of development since then, so I possibly haven't updated it as much as development has happened, but hopefully there are pointers along the way of places where you can find um, more up-to-date information. So we'll start with what is an integral field spectrograph. That didn't change in the last five years, so that's fine. Um, what is it? Uh, as Kara was saying, it's, it's, a, it's actually a, I think they're really amazing instruments that really allow you to gather um, optical and near infrared spectra. Um, over a two-dimensional field of view, and I specify optical near infrared because the radio people have been doing this for decades, and I think we're a bit slow on this one. So the final product is a data cube, and in your data cube you have spatial information, RA and deck, but you also have wavelength information. So each point in this image is made up of by summing um, the wavelength information that uh, forms the z-axis of your cube. So this is um, a very um, many, many different things you can do with an instrument like this. So it's a very powerful way of imaging the universe. So what can I study with such a thing? Lots of things. Um, I'm actually going to start, I'll start with stellar people. Star people, uh, so this is, a, a, again, a summed image of a uh, spatial RA deck with a galaxy in the background, because that's what I work on. Um, and uh, the grid shown by this is the spiral um, integral field unit that's has changed since 2011. That's now defunct and has been replaced by the Koala instrument on the AAT. But each square here is a stack zone, that's your points across the galaxy. Now, I love this because it gives me spatial information on the galaxy rather than a multi-object spectrograph that just tends to, especially with fiber, just gives you a single point at the center of the galaxy. You have lots of spatial information. Um, star and planet people use all of that information and sum it all up into it single point, which makes me sad, um, but uh, we'll just move on from that because I will tell you what it can really do, which is um, it can tell you, so, oh, for a galaxy, it can tell you where galaxy winds are blowing out gas and shocking the surrounding medium. Can tell you where star formation is occurring in the galaxy. Is it in the center or did when you put down your single fiber? Did you miss all of the <coughs> information? Because the star formation was happening right over here. Where is the dust? What is it doing? Probably nothing. Dust kind of boring. Um, the most fascinating, boring subject in astronomy. Uh, rotation measures. What is that? How are the gas and the stars moving? Do they move the same way together or do they move differently? Uh, angular momentum. Uh, Interesting, but uh, where uh, are the oldest stars in the galaxy? Uh, where are the most metal rich, rich stars and gas? And as well as dynamical mass measurements, so taking actually using how the stars are moving to measure the mass rather than just looking at the stellar mass that's coming from the light of the stars. And those two have subtly different forms of um, give you subtly different uh, information on the galaxy. So, this is a lot of things that aren't really possible using any other um, observation, or at least not possible in as complete a way. So this is uh, a 2010 paper from Rob Sharp and Joss Van Hawthorne looking at galaxy winds, and so these are emission line integrated flux maps. So what they've done is taken a specific uh, emission line, so H alpha, there's definitely up there, and some others, the spatial resolution is terrible, but there's some, and they've looked at the spatial maps in, a particular, in particular galaxies of these emission lines. But then they can take that information and look at the ratios of those lines and use that in um, what we call uh, an I, IDD, diagnostic diagram, uh, 
to look at which then looks like one of these, and you can look at where, uh, so this is the ratio of N2 to H alpha and O3 to H alpha. I should know this off by heart, but I don't. Um, and this is a diagnostic line that tells you whether the these green points would be star forming um, stacks, and these are individual stacks also within the galaxy. These aren't individual galaxies. So you can see where there is um, ionization emission and when there is AGN emission. There's a better word for that. But, uh, and so the slope you, of the ionizing continuum. Yeah, thank you. Um, but then you can plot that and spatially see where an AGN is having most effect, where star formation is having most effect, and when the gas is being shocked um, by galaxy winds blowing off data, uh, blowing off, uh, blowing off from the galaxy. So this is suddenly becomes this really powerful way to find galaxy winds and study them. And so there's been updates on this from using SAMI from uh, Lisa Fogarty in 2012 and Yi Ho uh, in 2014 and 16. So adding many more galaxies. So to date, the you know the number of galaxies that with galaxy winds that have been studied is actually very small. But this method allows you to find them and study them in more, much more detail, which is really exciting because this is a major component to our idea of how galaxies stop forming stars. So we, we kind of need to understand this a bit better. So where star formation occurs, uh, this is these are galaxies observed. This is Sloan galaxies images observed with a spiral um, integral <coughs> unit by me. And so this galaxy has its uh, star formation. This is the H alpha emission um, imaged. As so you can see, the star formation is right at the center of this galaxy. But this galaxy, you can start to see um, the arms of the galaxy. So the star formation is much more distributed. And so you can see that from some of my work is being updated by Adam Schaefer for SAMI observations. <coughs> uh, you can look at whether galaxies are disk or merger dominated, particularly there's been done a lot of high redshift. This is Emily Wisnowski's work um, looking at uh, Wiggle Z galaxies at redshift of one and trying to determine whether the, where's the, this is the velocity, uh, gas velocity maps. And you can fit a disk model and try and ask whether the galaxies are consistent with being disks even at those redshifts. And some of them are, which is quite exciting. And the SIN survey at even higher redshift. And Andy Green here has done this at a lower redshift. And again, you need really need integral field observations to do that. You can look at stellar rotation, <coughs> these are the brightest cluster galaxies, Sloan images of, and this is BMOS, um, integral field observations, and you can uh, with of the stellar velocities going from minus to plus 100 near enough. You can see things like this that uh, show no rotation in their stellar velocity, and things like this that show significant um, rotation in their velocities. And the Atlas 3D team, who really pioneered a lot of the, the work we do um, in early type galaxies with the integral field unit, developed a parameter to describe it, uh, the angular, specific angular momentum as lambda parameter. Um, and then divide their galaxies up into blue, fast rotating things, green are kind of non regular rotators, and red things are slow rotators. And this has been, um, there's been a lot of work using this parameter in the last five years. Um, so, brightest cluster galaxies, Jimmy 2013, big massive things, uh, Sammy 2014 15 by Lisa Fogarty, and Jesse van der Sander is uh, working right now on. Um, these measurements for the whole of the SAMI survey. Uh, you can look at star formation histories. Sorry, I should mention some part of the reason I'm referencing the work that's being done in Australia is so that if I, if you're interested, or you can uh, read those papers, but also uh, you can remember those names and go and bug those people. The people are in the Australian community and are eminently buggable. Okay, sorry. Um, this is, uh, so this is uh, Richard McDermott, who's over at Macquarie. Uh, this is his work with the Atlas 3D survey, uh, looking at how the star formation histories of galaxies, um, mass, you know, star formation um, and mass formation has changed, changes depending on their current uh, dynamical mass. So um, you can see that very massive things, the red line, form very quickly at low red, um, 
a long time ago, very early on in the universe, whereas low mass things now have uh, did start forming then, but have continued to form over a much longer period of time, much slower formation. We can look at where the oldest and the most metal-rich stars, this is from the Sauron sample, um, uh, so you, uh, the intensity of the galaxy, <coughs> the age of the galaxy, uh, the metallicity and outer <coughs> abundances and velocities and uh, gradients therein. Actually, one of the things we're still limited in, we still take, uh, me included, take this fantastic map of information and we reduce it to a profile. So if any of you wonderful smart students and postdocs out there have a better way of dealing with this information, go for it. Because we really, we, we're actually, even though we've got all this wonderful information, we're still actually not utilizing all of it. And I think there's, there's, uh, there's space for the development there. So that's what you can study. It was already a rush through. But what kinds of integral fields, um, spectrograph are there? Um, as Kara was pointing out before, there are different, um, similar to multi-object spectrographs, there are different um, integral field spectrographs too. It consists of two, um, two components, the spectrograph and the integral field unit. So the integral field unit focuses the light and takes it down to a spectrograph. And that's um, particularly clear in instruments at the AAT, where both the Koala single integral field unit and the SAMI multiple integral field unit, both of those um, are the, the front end, they feed the light, and they feed the light back to, the, both of them feed back to the A omega spectrograph, so they're very, uh, two separate components. And the job of the integral field unit is to divide the 2D spectral plane into a continuous array. And that can be achieved through lenslets, so koala, um, well, lenslets to uh, people in Madrid to a spectrograph out, uh, output similar to the um, slitlets that um, Caro showed. And lenslets plus fibers is, lenslets plus fibers is more like um, Sammy and koala. They're fed by slit, um, fibers down to the slit. Which is broken up, and so again, you get this the same, you get a much wider wavelength of information. And a, an image slicer like Weiss goes down to the slip and over here, and it gives you your wonderful data cube. So, going through these in more detail, uh, the, I have expertise in one of these and not the other two. I'm gonna very quickly see which one of those that is, but anyway, so this lenslet array is uh, the input image is split up by a micro lens array. Uh, Light from each element is dispersed, uh, sorry, concentrated into a small dot and dispersed onto a spectrograph. Uh, dots are small, so the spectra don't fall on top of each other, allowing the input image to be sampled contiguously. Uh, disadvantage is that the length of the spectrum is small because you're doing something really stupid on your CCD. So the packing of the CCD is insufficient. Um, examples of this are flames, uh, Osiris on Keck and the Sauron on the WHT. It's one of the reasons why the wavelength range of the Sauron and Atlas 3D servers is so small. So fibers with or without lenslets. Um, as a 2D bundle of optical fibers transfer the light to the slit of the spectrograph. The fiber flexibility allows the round or rectangular field of view to be reformatted into one or more slits where, from where the light goes to the spectrograph. And again, um, as Karen mentioned, so you can actually go down to, it at the AAT, you can go down to the AOMAGO, a omega room and actually follow this light path from the slit to the to the mirror and back to the spectrograph. Uh, you can place an array of contiguous lenslets to focus the light, and that's what Koala does. Uh, so without lenslets, you've got the WHD integral, um, and with you have A omega, Koala, Sami, uh, GMOS, and BLT BMOS. And then image slicer, uh, in this one the input image is formed on a mirror, segmented in thin sections. Uh, focal ratio degra degradation, so nice jargon there, um, which is what we, uh, it's light loss due to fiber uh, transmission over fibers is avoided in this, so that it does have higher throughput and the slicing arrangement does give a contiguous coverage of the field at potentially high spatial resolution. But we also have high spatial resolution with, with fibers too. So, and fabric arrows, uh, these are tunable filters um, that produce 
data cubes, they allow a large field of view, e.g. five arc minutes. Uh, so five arc minutes compared to news, which is the current largest format uh, integral field unit, and we're super excited to have an arc minute. So five arc minutes is huge um, to be sur surveyed at high and spatial resolution. Uh, the required data volume is built up by scanning through the desired wavelength range, so this isn't a very quick process. So how do I prepare integral field spectrograph observations? Um, as Caro said, preparation is everything. With all observations, never turn up the day before go, hmm, what am I going to look at? Uh, <laughs> you're an instrument scientist, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, what are you looking at? Uh, what field of view or spatial and spectral and spatial resolution wavelength coverage do you need? That will actually help you choose your um, integral field spectrograph. There's actually a list that's only minorly out of date at um, ifs.wiki.com. Um, you can choose your integral field spectrograph based on this list and the availability to you, although you can go get a collaborator where the other instrument is otherwise. Um, use the provided exposure time calculator to calculate exposure times. Uh, think about the calibration observations you'll need. Data without the appropriate calibrations is useless, so why waste your time? Um, obviously, you'll need a bias of flat and arc, probably for integral field work, it's really important to get twilight flats, they help with throughput correction, um, and uh, spectrophotometric standard stars will help you with flux calibration. Uh, prepare. I'm probably a bit agnostic about finding charts these days, but you know, if you're looking at single objects, go for it. Prepare finding charts, label your target. It means that when you're at the telescope and you're all sleep deprived and the instrument scientist or telescope operator is saying, is this your galaxy? You can go, ah, uh, yeah. Makes it easy. So think about vignetting and bad fibers. Um, so for example, the VMOS field of view has some, um, these are, the quadrants are officially this big, but the white parts are where there is significant vignetting. So you probably don't want to find that the interesting part of your galaxy lay here or here or here or here. You can get uh, avoid things like that by dithering, so just taking the, the first observation, second observation, and moving around and making sure that you cover those gaps. Uh, how do you reduce, view, and analyze your data? So this actually is an interesting one because I've changed how I've done this over the last five years, but uh, basic production steps are the same as all spectra. Uh, your data will arrive as raw, uh, raw and row stack spectra. Anyway, not a cube. Uh, so they look like that as well. I think that's the AAT. So that's maybe, yeah, they look like that. Just zoomed in. You create a master bias, you take off the master bias, you need to trace the spectra, and you do that by creating a master spectroscopic flat so that actually has enough signal in. You can see all the fibers. So these are, this is a fiber flat, and you can. You can see all the fibers, and then you need to trace those fibers <coughs> on the flat. This is not the flat. So you trace the fibers on the flat so you know where they are because the signal is bright enough in the flat, and then you apply that trace to your data and you can pull out the science spectrum even though the science data are not in any way bright enough to see it along the length, or at least the things I look at. Uh, to see along the length of the slip. Um, so, once you've traced it, you probably have single spectra, subtract the bias, divide the image by the flat field, extract one of the spectra, high wavelength calibration. Uh, you can check the wavelength calibration with the skylines. If you have skylines, and I recommend the um, particularly in the blue, there's one significant skyline at 50. 577 angstrom. Try and observe that. Make sure you observe it because it just makes life really easy. You can really check your wavelength calibration really simply if you have that in your data because it should be at 5577 angstrom. If it isn't, something has gone horrifically wrong. It's a nice check. And in the red, there are many more skylines, which is good and bad. Um, so, and you can also use your skyline to check um, how the heat of that line should varies in wavelength, um, well, varies from frame to frame, so I'll show it in the next week. 
So for A omega, these um, so I koala and um, semi, these processes are easily done with 2D FPR program, um, but there are examples of this afternoon. The VMOS data, I used VIPGI in 2011. Um, I've had students since then work with the ESO pipeline. I suspect they equally um, have their good points and bad points. Cool. Uh, IFS, specific reduction. So these are specific to integral field rather than um, paths. Some of these concepts are possible within packages. So to do this stuff, I in, have used IDL in the past. I'm now moving to Python. Um, I suspect most of you more generally work with Python rather than IDL. Um, they're kind of the same. So, uh, and there are packages out there that combine these things and make them publicly available. Look on um, uh, things like uh, GitHub as well. I mean, two of my students have placed their whole reduction regimes on GitHub. So you may find what you need just pre pre written. Uh, take each observation. Um, VMOS provides four quadrants, so you have four quadrants for each observation. You'll be needing to create a variance array for each spectrum. You do want to know about your noise. Scale for different fiber transmissions. So, oh yeah, so that's, <laughs> this is, I couldn't find this, inf this information must be available now, but I couldn't find it at the time. So I um, uh, procrastinated for a while and wrote a um, text file with the uh, fiber number. Uh, and spatial position of it because if you're row stack spectra that gives you no idea of you know you've got fiber one through and this is about 400 but you have no idea what spatial uh, positioning that has uh, let me show you two dfdr actually um a omega provides you this uh for spiral which is uh spatial um, fiber number and then slit um spatial positions thank you yeah, which is uh, infinitely more helpful. I'm sure at least they do that now for Vimos, by the way. That's very bad. Anyway, um, with fibers, you don't necessarily get the same throughput or uh, transmission for the fiber um, as um, the one next to it. Mm -hmm. So you get patterns like this. You can use the fact that you have a skyline in your observation. There's no reason your skyline should change um, emission across your image, so you can use that information to take out and um, correct for this uh, fiber variance across your image. So you can subtract, subtract the sky. Um, if your galaxy is about that big, you can subtract your sky here and here. If your galaxy is much bigger, then you will need to subtract your sky with separate sky observations, which in, um, should be as long as your observation. So that's fine. Um, make it into a cube, um, and then you can go and do your analysis. And then I, uh, so reduce data, looks a bit like that. I don't know, this was left over from 2011, and I cannot for the life of me remember why I have a kitten on here, um, but I left it because it made me laugh. So um, how do I view these data? Look at them. It's much easier now than it used to be. Python just makes stuff really simple. So um, IDL or Python will just show you your, your uh, key very easily. Um, how do you analyze the data? It depends what you're interested in. Galaxy Stellar Kinematics, you can use there's Python and IDL software available from the Atlas 3D team, specifically Michaela Capillari here. 2D, Foronoi 2D tessellation to bin the pixels up, EPXF to fit stellar templates and calculate velocities, velocity dispersions. <laughs> Plot bin, it's a program that makes pretty color plots of velocities. This is all just now out there and freely available, so it's actually very easy to do these things now. Galaxy emission lines, similar kind of thing. The lazy IFU software developed by E Ting Ho at ANU um, is, I'm pretty sure that's either publicly available now or about to be, I'm sure he will share it with you. Um, it fits emission lines um, and tells you width, height, central wavelength, and flux. In terms of velocity maps. So, and the future is here because in 2011, Sammy was the future. The future is now here. This is the Sydney AAO multi object spectrograph integral field unit. Um, and there's a galaxy survey that's now going for a 
and the aim is to observe 3,400 galaxies. If the current run happening is super efficient and the way um, sky stays clear, they'll end up with 2,000 galaxies in, at the end of this, uh, sorry, the survey will have 2,000 galaxies at the end of this week. Um, anyway, Sammy's awesome and stuff. I can do that. Yeah, I'll All right, thank you very much, Sarah. <laughs> Before we have any questions, this actually is a really good chance for a little reminder. Um, there's some people who weren't here at the beginning, um, but because this is going, uh, the whole workshop is being um, sort of posted with it's so, uh, hashtag it's so AAO. And the general thing is, if, if somebody hasn't given their permission, make sure you're not taking pictures of their face. Um, and speakers who are fine getting their faces in, next to their slides, um, you know, say so. <laughs> um, and uh, are there any questions for Sarah? Uh, yes, if you want your With your uh, fibers, is yeah. the only characterization you do the fibers just looking at the decision loss once? So where you plot those uh, throughputs. I gather that the gaps in between are broken fibers. No, no, no. Um, there are gaps. So each set of fibers is bunched, for want of a better word, into a block. And so, so there's a gap between those blocks. And you want that because that helps you characterize um, scatter flight and other such wonderful issues. So you broke the other Oh, that's, that's either unallocated or broken. Some of those are. These are Swiss blocks. It's what, these, what? Are, these are broke. These are dead fibers. These are Swiss blocks. Yeah, that's spot on. Yeah. But also, so this, this, this block, you only did that once. Yeah. So, the one position of the power <coughs> cable. Like, when you move the power uh, cable. Um, and likewise, there's the. No, these are, these are generally characteristic for those fibers. So, yes, you could do it for each of them. I probably would do it for each observation, uh, maybe, sorry, each galaxy, probably not each specific observation, but you will take a very small amount, that would be the same across all observations, that's not going to change a huge amount. That's <coughs> a characteristic of the fibres themselves rather than where they're going to be. Sure, because when you flex the fibre, things do change. They, things do change, but not... I would just do it as a matter of cause with each set of observations, but mm. I don't, it wouldn't matter that much. I mean, I was the instrument scientist for this. Oh, I just the instrument the telescope tracked across the sky. From oh, God, no, 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 not on that kind of, no, I mean, night to night, maybe, mm. but I'm talking at kind of 1% level. Mm. And you've got bigger issues with, like, uh, flux calibration and all that. Flux calibration will be more uncertain than it. Is it possible to implement an AO system by views? Yes, and it has, it happens at Keck, so Keck and VLT, definitely Keck has, um, so Osiris on Keck is uh, uh, adaptive optics, um, brings in other issues if you want to talk about those, Andy Green and David Fisher down at Swinburne are kind of <coughs> Australia's experts in those problems. Thank you. Last quick question. Yeah. I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about individual bundle size and how big that would be. So for Sammy? Uh, well, yes, my might be more of NIFS, but yeah. I don't know what NIFS, actually I don't know NIFS field of view to be honest, uh, but so for Sammy it's a, each bundle is a bundle of 61 fibres, each fibre is 1.5 arc seconds across, giving you, um, as they're yeah. pulled together, it's about 15 arc seconds across the bundle. And so that's what you have on the sky. And you have 13 of those on a one degree field of view. And then one of those is a. Uh, there's a three one three half second field of view, and it uses a third of those concepts you have in front of the given star sun. Yep. So it's the whole part of the small. Yeah. 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 <coughs> Alright, great. Well, thank you very much, Sarah. Are you going to be around by the lunch for questions? Yeah. A little bit? Okay. Alright, thank you very much.